He kōna e purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora and welcome to the Kim Hill Collection. Look, sometimes you got to sell an interview and sometimes an interview sells itself. And this most certainly falls into the latter category. This chat from late 2008 is between Kim Hill and the newly crowned New Zealand Gardener of the Year, an 86-year-old nun named Sister Loyola Galvin. It is an absolute delight, and that's all there is to say, really. We do hope you enjoy it. Sister Loyola Galvin has been gardening only for a decade or so, but she took to it and she's just been awarded the title of New Zealand Gardener of the Year by the eponymous magazine. Sister Loyola is based at the home of Compassion in the Wellington suburb of Island Bay and that is where her garden is, along with the allotments she set up for city folk with no gardens of their own at 86 years of age. She is an example to us all. Hello, congratulations. Thank you very much. I said, after Ignatius of Loyola. Yes. The founder of the Society of Jesus. You've done your homework. What was your name before that? Johanna. Johanna. From my grandmother. Right. Yes. And what made you become a nun? Well, I, um, <laughs> well, uh, I was a nurse for a start. I did my nursing training during the um, war. And like a lot of other people of my era... Uh, a name on a casualty list meant that I had to rethink things. That's one stage. You lost your lover. <laughs> oh, well, I lost, I, lost, I lost someone who I was very attached to. And But the thing is, um, I had a cousin who was very badly injured in the war. He lost a leg and had other injuries, came back, and we spent a lot of time together, a lot of time, as I was a young, you know, young person. And This but, was where? This is uh, in here, Taranaki here, here in Wellington. Or you, you no, no. I was up in Taranaki. I, I trained in Wellington because I was turned down for nursing in Taranaki. That uh, I had had osteomyelitis as a child, and Doctor Fogg, who was the medical secretary of Hara Hospital, wouldn't take me as a nurse. He said I wouldn't stand up to nursing because my I'd had so much problem with my osteomyelitis as a child. It was quite debilitating then. Well, well, well I was off, you know, off school a lot and all. And in those days. Osteomyelitis was a an, an serious thing. No antibiotics. Mm. You just had to build, um, take out the buggy bits of the bone and build the child up. It's like constant infection, isn't it? Yes, yeah. But, but it, it, um, I, I had a very healthy background, but it was an accident that caused it. And then I, that my, that's what my family did, built me up, and I stayed home from school quite a bit on crutches that Dad made for me, followed him around the garden and loved it. And I got better. And this would have been what during the depression. Well, it was um, I, I. It was during the thirties. Yes. Yes. And and uh, yes. And so he gardened your yes. father very much. So yes. Right. And we had a small property uh, just on the edge of Hara, and we had cows and and a garden. And Dad was had a um, poultry farm, and and um, uh, there we were. And I had the best of both worlds. My mother, well, I had a lovely mother also, and she managed a shop in town. And that's how we managed it. She was not an outside person, but, but I followed Dad round. I had an older sister, who, who I, whom I've lost, but I was the outside one. I'm thinking of the secret garden here. Do you remember that? It's just the yes. juxtaposition of the garden and the crutches. Excuse yes. me, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But anyway, you were fish enough to go nursing in the end, even though they decided you weren't in Taranaki. Yes, Dr Fogg said no, and I tried Wellington. I, um, I I wanted to go nursing because I'd fallen in love with nurses when I was in the hospital. They were a lovely lot, the Hara nurses. And so I tried Wellington, and I had a little miracle. What happened? That We had to be re-examined, and I went to... Uh, we were being done in alphabetical order with um, Jesse Fuller and Helen Grant, because I'm Galvin, so GA went in the middle. And I was, I was waiting waiting with me, undressed, and, you know, just the pants and bra and the cape on, and the came, nurse came in and said, um, doctor had a phone call. Um, he said, I can't do any more. There's been a tragedy in the Wairarapa. It was the day that the Japanese problem of rioting in, the, you know, yes, in, in 19, 1943 it would have been, I think. Yes. Yeah, and um, the doctors all had to go away. And the doctor said, and the nurse said, what about this one? Just standing in the middle of the room, semi-dressed. Mm-hmm. And he said, hop up on the bed. 
I hopped up, and he listened to my heart and lungs, didn't read the notes, didn't follow, didn't look at my legs, feet, anything, said, she'll be right, out the door I went. So do you think if he looked at your legs and feet, oh, he, he wouldn't probably, have got He'd gone into the notes, because I've, I went up to Stratford to Dr Doris Gordon to ask her if she'd... I went to school with her granddaughter, I believe. Did she? Yeah. Well, she was a wonderful woman's doctor. And I went up there after I was turned down in horror, and I thought she might she might pass me. But she said, I agree with Dr Fogg. I don't think your leg will stand up to it. But you see, with a wise woman she was, she said, I think you ought to be allowed to try and fail, and then you'll know you can't do it. So she provisionally passed me, but Wellington had to had to say it was okay. And see, Wellington never got round to it because the doctor was too busy, and I just went on from there. So has it caused you pain, discomfort, or inability? No, it never caused me anything, really. At all? I, I was just determined to get over it. And as children in those days, we, we, were, we weren't given um, painkillers. It was wrong to give children drugs. So we learned to get on with it. And we had wonderful nurses who were very, very skilled at distracting us when they were doing these horrible dressings. And we had competitions and we sang and we, 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 we had a wonderful child, Frances Marchant, who had had 32 abscesses all over her body with osteo. And she was the big girl in the, in the ward. She taught us all the pop songs of the day and we sang them while we were having our dressings done so that we wouldn't cry. Oh, it was good training. <laughs> but anyway, I went. To, I, um, I got through there, and then Dr. Fogg became the medical superintendent of Hutt. And during, the, during um, that time, Wellington sent nurses out there. They didn't have a training school in Hutt. And I dodged Willie Fogg because I was a bit scared he might say I shouldn't be there. But then we were finishing an operation when I'd just finished my training, and he, someone said, Nurse Galvin, do this or that. And... He, when the operation was over, he was a little bit unusual. He, um, he s- said, take that mask off, nurse. And I took it off. And he said, you're not the little kid, Galvin, I, gave, I, I um, turned down for nursing in Hara. <laughs> yes. How long have you been training? Three years. I've just sat in my hospital final. I was too scared to tell him I'd just done it with triple honours. <gasps> and, he, and he said, how long have you had off with your foot? I said, I haven't had half an hour, and I hope this is suitable for, for uh, radio, but you'll have to cut it out if it's not. But I'll tell you what he said. <laughs> he said, I'll be bloody well buggered, and invited me to dinner. That's where it, where it was. Normally, doctors didn't talk like that. <laughs> Normally, days. nuns don't talk like that either, <laughs> I can tell you now. <laughs> so anyway, that's what happened. Anyway, I went on. And, uh, and uh, so then uh, uh, that was it. So I went on um, with the nursing. And then, um, as I said, well, uh, after I'd finished my training, I looked around and I worked in a few other hospitals. My ambition was to work in the Hara Hospital where I'd been, and I did for that for a while. And then I met the Sisters of Compassion, and uh, I had a relative by marriage who had a sister, had an aunt there. And I sort of, I'd fallen in love with handicapped kids when I was uh, nursing because I could have been one. So uh, I thought, I'll give it a go. But I was, I'd done a lot of boys' things. I, so we only had two girls in the family, and I was the son Dad didn't have. Right. So I did all the boys' things, and I loved it. I even rode racehorses at one stage, but ladies in those days didn't ride in races, but we did training. So, so I, you were a, jog, a training jockey? Training jockey. <laughs> so I've, uh, I'm about, I'm, I've always been, been around about seven stone. Or, you You're know, a knee high to a grasshopper. 50 kilos. Yeah. So anyway, so, um, that's what happened, and so um, I just went on from there. But... The nursing I loved, and I thought, well, and I loved men too. I was always, had lots of, Dad was a good sportsman, and he had lots of men friends, and I was always in a men's world. And I thought, I don't know if I'd be able to strive in a woman's world, but I'll give it a go. And then the, the, the handicapped children drew me. So I thought, you don't take the final vow until you've been there five years. So I thought, you can always walk out. So I thought, I'll have a go and see what happens. And I've been there um, nearly 60 because I fell in love with the kids, the handicapped kids. You and could have worked with people. handicapped children or been a nurse or anything you liked anywhere. outside a- anywhere. the church. Why would, why, what drew you to Well, the... I, I thought, felt the Sisters of Compassion. Uh, uh, you had a O'Bear. calling. Suzanne O'Bear, ah. who, who started the Sisters of Compassion, was very much for the underdog. Always worked for the underdog yeah. and the and the underprivileged. And my father, with an Irish background, he was born in New Zealand, but he was very political. And I learned about Suzanne O'Bear early on as she was looking after the underdog and I thought that, that attracted me and that was another factor in it. So I thought, I'll have a go. 
and I fell in love with compassion. The older sisters, the really old sisters who'd had the tough days and had, some of them had known Suzanne O'Bear, they were wonderful people. And they, I mean, I felt it was a good show, and I stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> so you were, you were a nurse throughout yes. that. You worked with handicapped children. You retired at the age of what, seventy two? Yes. And then was it at that point that you took up the gardening? Well, you see, um, you see I'd always been interested in gardening, and when, when I was a chaplain at the Hutt Hospital, which I was after forty years of nursing, I had fourteen years at, as full time chaplaincy at Hutt Hospital. Um, we had there was I had a wonderful garden gardener at the Sisters of Compassion place at, at Heratonga, where I lived. And on Saturdays I was off, and I used to raise seedlings for Noel. Noel Trajan was a wonderful gardener, and he, helped, he I learned a lot from Noel. That was my putting my finger into the garden, mm-hmm. but then I, the job was too big, and I, didn't, I, just, I, I, I couldn't do much with him. But anyway, so then when, Sister, when I came back, uh, back home to Island Bay, Sister Ray said to me, what would you like to do? So I said, I'd like to go outside and take on the grounds. So she said, you need some help. And I said, two days a week. We put an ad in the paper and got a wonderful woman, Kristen Neely, who works with me now. How and much land have you got? Four hectares. Four hectares. Yes. And you know what Island Bay is like. It's windy. We had to establish shelter to get a veggie garden going. You, see, you grow veggies, don't you? I do. Yes, and you know what it's like <laughs> sliding down hills and they're blowing out by the wind? Tell me about <laughs> it. Well, Somebody told me that a gust of wind blew you down a bank two, three toward, years ago. Yes. Mm. And you broke your pelvis. Yeah, double, double fracture of the pelvis and complete rupture of the right uh, of the tendon and right shoulder. And the doc, uh, I could move that much. And the doctor said, in 18 months you might get movement. Well, I thought, mm-mm. So I, we had an old battery-powered wheelchair. I got to get a battery for it. And I got into that because I couldn't really walk much at tour for a start but I did a you know you had to walk nowadays when I was training you rested people who fractured their pelvis you don't know you get them to get up and walk it's very sore because you've done it in two places but it was worth it and I got the old wheelchair and got up to the up to the bottom of the hill because we were on a hill of course and then I we <laughs> Kristen and I went to the tip one day and we found a frame that you could put up to put to, to hold up side of steps so we put that in and I could get out of the wheelchair and hang onto the frame and get up and back in the garden. And it didn't take me very long. And you see, this arm that I might have got some movement in. Perfect. Um, and listeners, Sister Luella is waving her arm around <laughs> like she could bowl for the Yankees. You're an adventure nun, essentially, aren't you? <laughs> well, uh, I've had so much joy in my life, really, right from the start. I've had my ups and downs, and there have been misunderstandings, and there have been all sorts of things, and, and sadness. And in a way, I'm glad that I had experience with grief when I was so young, because it's been a help, particularly in my nursing and in my chaplaincy. See, when I was at the Hutt Hospital, we started still with support out there, and when, I was, when I was out there, and uh, that's gone on to be over all over New Zealand a wonderful um, English midwife and three mums. We start, got that started there, and it's all over the place now. So I've had lots of... Uh, I've been able to stick with yeah. things and be able to have lots of fun. So you did a permaculture course? Yes. Sister Sue Cosgrove is our sister up the River on Jerusalem. Yes. She was, Sue's a lovely person. I've met her. Oh, she's lovely, and she does a great job up she's there. She's fantastic. Well, she's fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Sue was going to a permaculture course and something happened up there. And you know when, you, when you're working with Maori people, you can't just walk out? Mm-hmm. And she said, oh, I've got to stay. I just somebody died. And somebody died or something happened. She said, would you take on my permaculture course? And I said, would they take an 80-year-old? And she said, uh, oh, you'd keep up with them. You'd get ahead of them. And I said, oh, we'll have to ask them, which they, we did. And they said, yes. They had 23 young people. And you. And me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I bet they couldn't keep up with you. Oh, we had fun. Yeah. We were, in, we were, we were um, divided into groups, and I had boys, all boys in my group, young men, young men and um, two from the States, a guy from Great Britain and uh, Kiwi. And we got very good marks because I had been, while I, when I came back home, I joined Forest and Bird, and I went for 10 years to Soames Island planting trees over there. So I had a background, I had some idea of shelter and trees and water and right. stuff. So I was able to put the Kiwi part that was necessary in. They were good at maths and all that sort of stuff that I'd forgotten about and didn't want to do anyway. And so we got good marks. 
And you got the practical on the ground training yes. that you needed. Yes, so we had fun. So you've got allotments going up at the Home yes. of Compassion. Well, I, well, after I'd done, done permaculture, I saw a little thing in the paper one day, or a local, one of those local rags, meeting about, about permaculture. So I went and I met a Canadian boy who'd done permaculture and he was a student and he wanted some ground for some friends of his to have a community garden. So I asked Sister Ray, and she very kindly said, oh, there was a big piece up near the childcare they never used, like a big So cat- there's plenty of stuff for the home of compassion needs, oh, and yes. this is the ground separate, that you separate, don't... Separate, you don't, garden. Yeah, right, okay. separate garden. Yep. Uh, we, we were doing fine over an hour, big garden. So um, I start, we started off with that, and there's a, that the, the people who work with have changed, students there for a year and then moving on, and other people who've had other commitments. And one lovely lady, Kate Smith, she's English. She's bought a house in Island Bay now, so she doesn't need her plot. She's handing it on. But she's staying with us because she's a very, very reliable, lovely person, and she's learnt lots, and she can help, you see. And if they, they work on Sunday afternoons because they all have jobs and they have to do other things, so they come on Sunday afternoons. And another... Uh, Rowan Tanner is a young man, he's 22 now, and he's, he was very wise. He's done permaculture, and he put lots of shelter in, like Tagasaste and, the, and all those short-growing, quick, quick things that'll put up your shelter. Yeah. And then and he's got uh, Italian alder coming on, de coppice. Right. So uh, it's good. And your permaculture training would have taught you all about the best sort of compost to make. Oh yes. Well, you see, I, I was always you get crazy. the seaweed. I suppose I was always crazy about compost because Dad used compost. And yes, we yes I use seaweed. Now that they've um, blocked off the the part down by Island Bay, that's fine. It's a good idea to have that reserve. But we go further. But I've always used seaweed, and you see, seaweed's a wonderful. Resource. Do you chop it up before you put it in the compost yes, pile? Yes, we do. Right, we chop it all up. Everything going to compost is better chopped up. Yeah. It's much faster. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. the young people now have got a really good thing going with the compost. And do you, do you compost your horse dung or do you put it fresh on? This is the no, source of great compost, debate. No, compost, compost. You'll get weeds if you put it fresh oh, on. Oh, I know. Okay. You've tried that. <laughs> I know. I've got a garden full of weeds. What do you do for slugs and snails? We don't have them. What do you mean? Well, I've discovered that... Slugs and snails, you know that too, everybody knows, they've got soft bodies and they won't walk on prickly things. We have our garden surrounded by pine needle paths and slugs and snails won't walk on pine needles. Ah. So if you surround your garden with pine needle paths... Or shells, presumably. Well, uh, shells probably would work, but it's got to be something that'll stick into their tummies. They don't come. Ah. So we we have almost completely a, a slug and and um, snail free. Oh well, that's very Christian. Garden. And you don't kill them; you just I can't be them. killing anything. No. And they, I don't know where they go. They'd probably go to your garden. Yeah, up in Brooklyn. They, are, they find a haven in my garden. Um, tell me about comfrey. Comfrey. Oh, I love comfrey. Yeah. That uh, I find uh, I've learned. Like I see, and I've always read about gardens and learned as much as I can. Well, I found. And uh, Kristen, my, my assistant gardener who works with me, she's an employed lady, she bought me the first piece of comfrey. She grows it. And comfrey's a wonderful herb. You've got to grow it on the edge because, you know, it take over if you it don't. It does take over. But it's a big, strong thing. But and it's good for the compost. It's good for the compost. It's also, if you make comfrey tea, not for yourself, but for, but for the plants, it's a very, very good fertiliser. Oh, okay, so you soak it in water? Soak it in water. Have a drum, no, like a 40-gallon drum, or, 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 um, you, a, with a big garden, but anybody have a bucket, and soak the leaves in the bucket for a fortnight, three weeks, and then water down the constituency to weak tea and pour it round your seedlings and things. They just go... Whoosh. Really? Oh, yes. Goodness me. You've won $5,000. What are you going to do with it? You want to get more people into the garden with it? Well, I'm very interested in that. And people who can't, uh, perhaps can't afford a few tools or something like that and want help. And also I'm trying to to encourage uh, as many people as I can to garden, and especially older people, because I think a lot of older people give up too soon. That's been one of my things all along. You know, so many people get a bit of arthritis and then, oh, you know. And the arthritis, when we had the arthritis ward out at Hutt Hospital, and their, their big thing is move it or lose it. And if you move it, even if it hurts a bit, it's worth it. 
and then you'll be. And listeners, she's waving her arms in the air again. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's lovely talking to you. Thank you so much. And congratulations again, Sister Loyola Galvin, who is New Zealand Gardener of the Year.